This morning we are in Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, we're going to read about Jesus' trial before uh, Pilate and what it is that Pilate tries to do in order to get Jesus released and yet how he is unable to do this because the people are intent that he be crucified. We're going to try to understand why it is this happened. We're going to try to understand, too, that even though they did this, that there was still mercy that was available to them, as we've already seen in Acts chapter 3. So let's begin by reading the, uh, the passage, Mark 15, verses 1 through 15. Again, would you listen carefully to this as I read it? This is God's Word. Mark writes, early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders and scribes and the whole council immediately held a consultation and binding Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, it is as you say. The chief priests began to accuse him harshly. Then Pilate questioned him again saying, do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so Pilate was amazed. Now at the feast, he used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. The man named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists who had committed murder in the insurrection. The crowd went up and began asking him to do as he had been accustomed to do for them. Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he was aware that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Answering again, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him. But Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him, wishing to satisfy the crowd. Pilate released Barabbas for them, and after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. May the Lord bless his word again to our hearing this morning to encourage us again that what our Lord Jesus Christ went through, he did because it was necessary in order to save us from our sins. Now, we've just seen that after Jesus had been condemned by the leaders of Israel, they brought him to Pilate in order to have him executed. Remember that the Jews were under Roman occupation, under Roman law. They could not put Jesus Christ to death by themselves, at least they could illegally, but he was much too public of a figure. And again, because of the people. They were still afraid of the people. They did this in a way that the people wouldn't see, so that they wouldn't be alarmed, they wouldn't come to his aid. They brought him to Pilate early in the morning, really for just one purpose, and that, of course, was to execute him. Now, when he arrived, Pilate began by asking whether he was the king of the Jews. Now, I think we've already seen why he asked this question, because he had heard the people calling him such as he entered into Jerusalem. He's the one you call the king of the Jews. Are you going to reject him? But I think it's also, of course, possible that having heard that and realizing that saying such a thing would be an offense against Caesar because there's only one king, Caesar, and anyone who sets himself up as king opposes Caesar, this could very well have been the charges that the Jews brought against him. Now, this, again, is the only one question that Jesus was willing to answer with regard to uh, anything. Remember, he was as a lamb before his shears as silent. He did not defend himself because he came into the world to die. When he was asked, am I the king of the Jews or are you the king of the Jews? He says, it is as you say. And when the chief priests heard his response, they began violently to accuse him. And when Pilate saw that he didn't respond, he again asked, do you not answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But still he was silent to the point that Pilate was amazed. Now, here I think, um, again, as we, we look at this account, we get a fuller understanding from the different parts of, of Scripture, from the Gospels, to get a fuller understanding of what it was that Pilate was really faced with here and why it is that he was 
wanting to release the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know that there was a custom. We've already read about it. How Pilate, each year at this feast, would release for them one prisoner, which seems like a rather dubious practice, doesn't it? I mean, because these people could be guilty of anything, and he would just simply let them go. And so when the people came asking uh, to, to do for them as they had been accustomed that he would do, the first thing Pilate does is he offers to release Jesus to them. Now, there were other prisoners, but he thought perhaps Jesus was the one that they should be asking for. Well, why? Well, for one thing, Pilate realized Jesus was innocent. He realized that he was only there because the chief priests were jealous of him. They were envious of him, of his influence over the people. In other words, they were following him and, and not them. I think he offered Jesus first also because he thought this is the one they would want. After all, he was very popular with the people. Uh, they thought he was the prophet, the one that Moses had spoken of in Deuteronomy 18.15, that the Lord would raise up among the people of God and that they would listen to him. So Pilate was thinking for a couple of different reasons. They would want Jesus. He's innocent. They, they call him the king of the Jews. He is the prophet. Do you want me to release for you Jesus? Well, as you know, there was another man that the Romans were holding, a, a notorious prisoner by the name of Barabbas, who had been imprisoned with the insurrectionists and who also had committed murder. Now, it sounds from this text like the insurrectionists had done so, and perhaps they had, but Barabbas himself was guilty of murder. Well, Pilate felt bound to offer him as well. Perhaps they were the only two in custody at the time. And he asked, which of the two would you have me to release? Now, while he was waiting for a reply, we read in, in Matthew's gospel that his wife had suffered in a dream, greatly in a dream because of Jesus. So she sent word to her husband, have nothing to do with him because he is a righteous man. Now, it appears that the Lord had actually given her this dream to warn Pilate of what it was he was about to do. And that is, of course, hand him over for execution. Whether she really understand who he, he was or whether Pilate really understood this or that he was simply, this simply meant that he was innocent. He was a righteous man. In other words, don't condemn an innocent man. We don't know, but we do know one thing that from that point, after she communicated to him that dream, Pilate began to become afraid. But now somehow in the midst of this trial, as it were, the chief priest succeeded in stirring up the crowds to ask for Barabbas. And so not being able to release Jesus in the way he had hoped to, because they wanted Barabbas and not Jesus, Pilate then asked them, what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted, crucify him. Pilate says, why? Uh, he, as far as he could tell, he hadn't done anything wrong, certainly nothing deserving of death, but they were crying out all the more, crucify him. Now, we know that Pilate had some regard for justice. He didn't want to execute an innocent man, and so he says to him, according to John's gospel, take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. But they replied, we have a law, and by that law he ought to die, because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Now, when Pilate heard that, we read he was even more frightened. So Pilate takes Jesus away from the crowd once again into the praetorium, and he pleads with him. He says, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you, and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus said, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Now, you are going to be guilty of sin if you condemn me, Pilate, but the one who delivered me to you has an even greater sin. Now, from that point, Pilate made even greater efforts to try to release Jesus, but the Jews said to him, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. 
I tend to think that comes from the leaders rather than from the people. But realizing now that his position as governor was in jeopardy, he decided he wasn't going to fight with them any longer. As you know, he asked for some water to be brought. He washed his hands in front of the people, showing that he was not responsible for Jesus' death. And the Jews, of course, having declared that, he, that they were willing to accept the blame for this, his blood be upon us and upon our children, Pilate released Barabbas, and after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Now, again, why did all of this happen? You know, why did Pilate submit to the people's will? We saw it was out of fear, but why did the people themselves? Why were they willing to reject this one who was their king? The one that just earlier that week, I mean, we're only talking about one week. They heralded him as the Messiah, and now they're calling out for his crucifixion. Why did they reject the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, that's what I want us to consider uh, for a few moments. I want us to really see two things. First of all, that Jesus had to be rejected in order that you might live, in order that I might live, in order that he might become Savior. But secondly, I want us to see from what happens to the people who rejected him that there is still hope, even if you go to this degree, even if you call out for a murderer to be released, even if you say, let Jesus be crucified, even going to that extent, there is still mercy and grace because many of these people were actually saved. So first of all, let's consider the king was rejected so that you might live. Well, I think that you know uh, very well by now that what Jesus said to Pilate is true, that he is, of course, who he said he was. He is the king of the Jews. He is the seed of the woman, of course, that would crush the serpent's head. He is the seed of Abraham through, all, through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But he is also Shiloh, the one that would be raised up from the tribe of Judah, the one to whom all nations would obey or would, would submit to. And he is also the son that God promised to David, who would sit on his throne ruling forever. That he is the king, not only of the Jews, but basically of all the nations. Uh, he is the one to whom the father would say, after he ascends to heaven, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus is the king of all kings, he is the Lord of all lords. He is, as a matter of fact, your king and your Lord. This is the one that they actually rejected. This is the one who submitted to this kind of treatment in order that he might bring salvation. But the big question, I think, that's looming in this text is, again, why is it that these people rejected him? I think we can understand why the, the, people of, or the, the leaders of Israel did this, because they envied him. And we can understand why Pilate did this because his job was on the line. You know, we often are um, influenced by things outside of the Bible to, to do certain things, to accept certain things and reject certain things. If our job happens to be on the line, we perhaps will cover over certain things we believe. Uh, there's these types of outside influences. And here we see in the case of Pilate, he let something as trivial as we saw in Pilgrim's Progress, even the greatest positions in the world, uh, the greatest things that the world has to offer are nothing but emptiness, vanity, and worthlessness because they are things you can't hold on to. Pilate was willing to hold on to his position rather than to let this innocent man go free. Well, Pilate rejected him because his job was on the line, but why did the people reject Jesus Christ? It doesn't seem to follow from what we've just seen over the several weeks in the uh, Gospel of Mark. Uh, this is the one, as I said before, that just a few days, just a few days earlier, had heralded as the son of David, as the king of Israel, as the Messiah, the one that they were worshiping God for bringing, the one they called the prophet, the one who actually rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, which was you know, it was, it was not for no reason Je Jesus did that. That is the way that kings would present themselves in order to be anointed as king. He was presenting himself to Israel as their king, and they received him. 
Mark writes, and many spread their coats in the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. They knew who he was. They accepted who he was. They were glad he was there. They were worshiping God. What changed between then and now? Well, you know what? As we look through the Gospels, there was really nothing that changed. There was really nothing that happened from the time that he entered Jerusalem to his presentation before Pilate that should have changed their opinion. I mean, the leaders of Israel we've seen were even going out of their way to make sure the people didn't see what was going on. Remember, they took him by stealth in the garden, secretly at night, where he was away from the people because they were afraid of what the people might think. They took him to Pilate early in the morning so the people wouldn't see it and become alarmed. Why did they suddenly reject him? Well, I think they did it for a couple of reasons. The first is, of course, that Peter has already told us in Acts chapter 3, which we didn't read in Mark, that they were ignorant. There were certain things they knew, but apparently there were certain things that they didn't know. Now, what Peter, though, I want you to notice, so what Peter said about the people was not true of all of them. I mean, some of them actually did know who he was. Some of them were convinced who he was, and yet knowing who he was, uh, flat out rejected him, similar to what the Jews did to Stephen when he was preaching to them, as we read in our meditation. There were those who were stiff-necked, who were uncircumcised of heart, who were resisting the Holy Spirit, and had gone even so far as to accuse Jesus Christ of having done the work that he did by the power of Satan rather than by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, they had committed a sin that was so grievous, so serious, that Jesus said that sin never has forgiveness. That is what is called the unpardonable sin. But for the most part, the people of Israel, these people, were ignorant. They had an ignorance that was short of that sin. Again, as we saw in, in Acts 3.17, they didn't yet fully realize who he was. They didn't have the insight that their leaders and teachers had because they didn't have as much knowledge as they had. But I think it wasn't simply because they didn't have enough evidence. There was another reason. It was because it was God's will that they did not see who Jesus was, at least for the time being. Now, that might surprise some of us. How, how can we believe that it wasn't God's will that they know that who this person was, especially since they vocalized it and they thought they knew who he was? And how could it be that God would not want them to see who Jesus is when he sent, them in, sent Jesus into the world for the very reason to open the eyes of the blind and to save them by bringing them to himself? Well, the reason is because God didn't send his son into the world just for that reason. He sent his son into the world also to die. The scripture had to be fulfilled that Jesus would be opposed by his own people and handed over to crucifixion in order that he might save his people. Now, when Peter and John were arrested on a later occasion, um, I believe it was in Acts chapter 4, and they were threatened and released, and they came back to the other disciples to tell them what had happened. When the disciples heard, we read in Acts 4, verses 24 through 28, this. They lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city... They were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose
predestined to occur. Why is it that the people were ignorant? Why did they go from praising and heralding Jesus Christ as the King of Israel to calling out for his crucifixion in the course of that week? It's because the Lord had determined that Jesus had to be handed over. He had to be rejected by the kings. He had to be rejected by the peoples, by the rulers of the earth. He had to be rejected by the nation of Israel and handed over to crucifixion because that is what he had determined was going to take place. I think you need to realize that Jesus had to die. Jesus had to be crucified. That's why he came into the world, in order that he might offer himself as the only sacrifice that could possibly satisfy God's justice, the only sacrifice that might actually save all who would trust in him, even those who formerly rejected him. So basically, the first point is, is this. The king was rejected. And the reason why the king was rejected is because he had to be. It wasn't possible that Israel could receive Jesus Christ as their king at that moment. That is not what he came into the world to do. He first had to die. He had to die in order that he might atone for sins. He had to be raised again from the dead. He had to ascend into heaven to receive an even greater kingdom, to be king over the Jews, but to be king over the entire world. That had to take place, or else you and I could not be saved from our sins, and we wouldn't have the great king as well as savior that we have today. But having said that, we do, I want to look at a second point, and that is that even though the people rejected their Lord and called out for his crucifixion, it didn't mean that they were without hope. There was still hope for them. And because there was still hope for them, there is hope for you as well if you have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ in the past, if you have not yet received him by hearing the gospel by receiving the gospel. Now, the Bible says if you haven't committed the unpardonable sin, there is always hope because of the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you do need to remember that the unpardonable sin is a sin that cannot be committed by a believer. It can only be committed by an unbeliever. Let me just remind you again of what the unpardonable sin is. When an unbeliever knows who Jesus Christ is, he knows that it's by the Spirit of God that he does what, what he does. And he in some ways has experienced not only the truth and knows the truth, but even some of the workings of the Holy Spirit as the Pharisees had done. When they reject Jesus Christ with all that light and with all that, that um, you know, opportunity or privilege that God has given to them, when they reject Jesus Christ with a whole heart, even to the point that they would say that he does what he does, knowing it's by the Spirit of God, but saying that he does it by the power of Satan. When somebody can reject Jesus Christ to that degree, they have committed a sin, which the Lord tells us is a sin that never has forgiveness. Basically, they've hardened their heart to the point where God gives them over forever. You know, the thing is that um, that is a sin that is spoken of in several places in Scripture. We see it in Matthew 12 where, where the accusation is actually made. And I believe we see it in Hebrews chapter 6 as well. And I know that you've read those passages before and just about any one of us at any time may have thought, have I committed this sin? Have you ever been concerned that this is what you've done? Maybe you've thought a bad thought about Jesus Christ or maybe you've decided to disobey him when you knew you should have obeyed him. And you didn't do what the Lord was calling you to do. You've resisted him. You've resisted the Spirit of God. And sometimes, perhaps you've thought you've gone to the point where he's not going to uh, forgive you again. That you won't be able to enter into heaven. That you've missed glory. You're not going to be able to share that fellowship with the saints and with the angels in heaven. You're not going to be able to see the Lord Jesus Christ or the beatific vision. Again, you know, most uh, Christians today are actually ignorant of, of that whole thing. Uh, many Christians think that somehow in heaven uh, what we get to do is what we enjoy doing on earth only more so. But really, heaven is completely unlike earth. Heaven, of course, is a place where God reveals his glory with such power. And 
the place is so saturated with the power of His Holy Spirit that we are swallowed up in this holy a sight of God, a sight that is so beautiful that we won't want to look at anything else. You know, we talk about the idea of seeing loved ones when we get to heaven. Oh, I can't wait to get to heaven to see this great historic figure, this man or woman who served the Lord, maybe Jonathan Edwards or George Whitfield or Charles Spurgeon. But we're not even going to really be concerned about seeing them so much as seeing God in this beatific vision and seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. And the thought that we might miss out on that because we've somehow offended God to the point where he will never forgive us. That's really a concern that you shouldn't have if you really are concerned to go to heaven for those reasons because only those who love the Lord would ever want to be in heaven for those reasons. And if you have that kind of love in your heart, it means you haven't committed the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin is when you are so steeled against God, when you hate Him so much, it's with a whole heart, you reject Him and you want nothing to do with Him. That is the unpardonable sin. So don't be afraid that you've committed if you have any desire for God at all. And realize that there is hope for those who haven't committed the unpardonable sin as well. Now getting back to the point here, and that is, that there is hope for those who reject Jesus Christ that is less than the unpardonable sin. I hope you, you see that. Even for those of you who may have heard the gospel many times and rejected Jesus Christ many times. And we know that that's true because of what we see in the lives of those who actually did reject him. Who said, we want the murderer, give us the murderer. We don't want Jesus Christ. So what should I do with Jesus? Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Get, get rid of this man. That's the sin they committed. And yet, they were forgiven. There was still mercy for them. Because shortly after Jesus was crucified and rose again and ascended to heaven, he poured out of his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. He started a great revival that brought thousands of these who had done these, committed these very sins. He brought thousands of them to repentance, 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, and shortly after that, another 5,000 of these Jews, and from what Peter tells the Jews, they were the very ones who actually denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, Jesus had to be rejected in order that there might be mercy and grace, but to those who rejected him, he showed them that mercy and grace because that's the kind of God he is. He is merciful and forgiving even to those who have rejected him in the past, even to the degree that these Jews did. Now what that means is this, that if you have heard the gospel before, but you've rejected it up to this point, even if you've done it many times, there is still hope. There is still mercy and grace. God actually offers that mercy and grace to you this morning. He stands ready to receive you. He stands ready to forgive you. If you're only willing to turn from your sins and to trust in the Savior. Now, if you've never heard this before, you need to realize that he offers this, this to you as well. I mean, the worst case example is the person who's rejected him several times. For the person who hears it for the first time, obviously, the Lord re uh, re offers you his gospel. He calls you to come. And if you will come, he will grant you full pardon of all your sins. And he will also grant you eternal life, that is, a place in heaven when you finally leave this world. Now, again, there was something else that we saw in this text that we also have to deal with, and it's basically this. What if you don't receive Jesus Christ? What if you hear the gospel again and reject him again. Why would you do that when God offers you such a, a, you know, a great gift of grace, full pardon and forgiveness and a place in heaven and delivers you from hell? Why would you do that? Well, the only reason you would do it is for the same reason that the Jews did in the first place. It's because of the ignorance of sin. You don't see the reason that you should do this. You don't see the, the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. You, maybe you don't, you're not convinced that you're a sinner 
and in danger of God's judgment. Well, how can that ignorance be overcome? Well, I can tell you, and you've already heard from me exactly this is what the Bible teaches, but you do need something more. You do need that work of the Holy Spirit to illumine this truth so you see it as what it really is, truth. And so that you will see the desirability of, of, of coming to God in this way and not staying as you were and so that you will turn from the way you were and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need that work of the Holy Spirit. And so if you can't find it in your heart to receive the Savior as He offers Himself to you this morning, then what you need to do is pray and ask that God would grant to you this illumining work of the Holy Spirit, that He would change your heart and break the power of sin. You realize the bondage of sin is more powerful than we can break by nature. We don't have the strength to break that chain. Only God does. But you need to realize that the king was condemned and rejected and took God's judgment on himself so that he might grant his Holy Spirit to break those chains so that if you would come to him, you would receive eternal life. So the question this text asks you this morning is this, why would you perish under God's judgment when God offers you forgiveness at the throne of grace, when he stands willing and ready to receive you, when he may even be willing to grant you his Holy Spirit to, to enable you to do so? Why would you perish when there is salvation, when the king went through what he did? in order to bring salvation to all who would trust him. Don't reject Jesus Christ again. Turn from your sins and trust in him. The Bible says that all who come to him, he will not cast out, but he will receive you. I hope you see the grace of God this morning in this passage in that the Son of God would be willing to go through these things so that he might be a savior and he offers himself to you this morning, don't turn away from that offer of grace. It may not always be there for you. There does come a time when, the, when the, the door is closed, and that's when we die, and we don't know the time of our death. It happens to us when we're young or when we're old. But one thing we do know, the longer we put it off, the more we put ourselves in danger of everlasting destruction. Don't be in danger any longer. But come to Jesus Christ and receive his mercy. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would help us to do that. There are several things we saw in this passage. Let's pray that the Lord would apply his word to us as we need to hear it.